Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. And on today's Top Med Talk, we're going to present to you the panel discussion, which followed the presentation that you've heard from Paul Wishmeyer, which was yesterday's podcast. This panel discussion is a discussion of enhanced recovery, a specific case, as you'll hear, of Joshua, taken from Paul Wishmeyer's talk, which preceded the panel discussion. Have a little listen. Top Med Talk. I've heard that talk a couple of times. I still hear the passion when Paul delivers that talk. Paul, can you join the panel, please? Mike, can you come up for the panel as well? And we're also going to be joined by Judy Thacker that Paul alluded to. She's president of the American Society for Enhanced Recovery. She's also a colorectal surgeon at Duke, specializing in inflammatory bowel disease. And also Desiree Chappell. Desiree Chappell is also on the board of the American Society for Enhanced Recovery. She's also very involved with EPBOM USA. She's a CRNA from Louisville in Kentucky and been running the Top Med talk that some of you may have seen for the last couple of days. And Monty's going to run the floor. So we're going to start with a case discussion. Please come along with either some questions, join in with the, with the case discussion as we, we go along. I thought... I've got two cases, uh, and normally find that we only get through one. We've got half an hour, and there's often lots to discuss. I thought long and hard about which case I should present, and what better case to discuss than Joshua. You've heard a lot about Joshua, and it's obviously a very emotional case for Paul, but I think there's a lot we can discuss, not just nutrition, but how we would manage Joshua's care generally. So I'll start off with Julie, colorectal surgeon. Joshua is a sort of patient that you may see for pre-optimization your thoughts on Joshua my thoughts would begin hopefully before I ever even got to meet him uh, one of the the pieces that I would love to see put in place which is going to be you know enhanced recovery plus with the bookends of, of things that are important is the patient has always had a doctor before a surgeon And that's not to say surgeons aren't doctors. (laughs) But they've had someone send them to the surgery clinic for a consultation. And it's at that point that I really think we have the best chance to say, I'm sending you to a surgeon. That means you may be cut open at some point. And if you are cut open at some point, we should probably optimize your nutrition. We should make sure that you're not anemic. We should think of these things. I will tell you that doesn't tend to happen. I have four or five Joshua's in my clinic every Thursday at Duke, and they look just like that. They're losing weight. They claim they have an inability to gain weight. They very often say they can't tolerate food or they have no appetite. That's the tricky one. And they are in horrible pain. So typically they're also in the U.S. on opioids. They're anemic. He's already dropped out of school. He's lost his tuition for this year and is in a bad place. And the first thing I need to do is stop and realize that that's not a patient I can save with an operation. And that's a very hard realization. I'm a fixer. I meet people, and I have things that I can do to them to fix the cause of how they got to that point. But I cannot fix him with an operation yet. And my intake form in clinic, which is electronic now, starts with the assessment. Have you lost weight over it? Now, that's a tricky one because very often they've lost weight over the last two years. So it doesn't strictly fit our criteria on the ponds, but it is still very telling. Can you gain weight? Are you willing to eat? Are you able to eat? How is your GI tract? And then also, are you anemic? And typically, we have some sort of blood work on the patient before they come to clinic. But if not, a simple chemistry will give me an albumin. And I start addressing those at the same time. I try to figure out how much time do I have before surgery. And you would delay surgery to optimize nutrition? That's a loaded question because I know we have done that many times. I do delay, yes. And I didn't used to. I, I really didn't. And until being exposed to this literature and probably anecdotally as well, starting to experience the difference it can make for even just a two- or three-week intervention and bringing these patients in. And interestingly, the patients almost all believe in it. They come in and the reason they want to have a GI operation is because they can't use their GI tract or it has a malignancy in it. But in my case, it's usually they can't use their GI tract the way they want to. And if I can somehow help them with that to get them to the point of surgery, they're very enthusiastic and compliant. 
And most of the interventions are fairly cheap. You would know prices sure. in the U.S. better. So I, I absolutely do delay. And I will also refuse. So I put them on an outpatient regimen and see them in a week. I want them to have stopped losing weight. And within two weeks, I hope that they've actually gained some weight. Most of the older folks will be able to start gaining some weight in that first two weeks. If they don't hit that marker, then I make a phone call to see if I need to use a vein instead of trying to use their GI tract. Mike, UK perspective on what will happen in your hospital and what you would like to happen in your hospital. I'd I'd say what used to happen. We used to have a mandatory hemoglobin HbA1c if you were diabetic BMI with the referral from the GP for patients who were potentially having surgery. And it's drifted, it's gone away. We need to bring it back. Paul, if you, what would you actually do? What do you think Joshua should actually take if you saw him again yeah. a month before surgery? I mean, what, what should he be given every day to start off with to help build up his nutrition? I think Julie said it well. Uh, you know, it... It um, is very difficult for them to gain weight. It's very difficult for them to eat. I can remember everything I ate when I was a 15-year-old came out as blood. And I would go to the bathroom 45 times a day. And how can you gain weight when that's what you're faced with? Not everyone, IBD clearly remits, and, and not everyone has, has the same course. And, and so if you can get them in remission with the better interventions we have now, you have some hope if you can get them there, and, and you can use oral nutrition supplements. That's what I would always lead with. You know, high protein has to have more than 18 to 20 grams per little can or bottle. Oral nutrition supplement is the place to start. How many times a day? Once a day? Twice a day. Three times a day at most. Most people won't drink more than that. Any particular product? You, you know, we have the most evidence in a large randomized trial, and I'll mention in the next talk for, and I do work with them. I work with all the companies because I would like us to have better products. But the Abbott Insurance Live has about a 700 patient trial in the post hospital setting that reduced death. It also has HMB in it, which those of you who know Danny Bear here um, in London, she's doing a large study on HMB in critical care patients. And HMB is a leucine like derivative found in catfish, actually, that stimulates anabolism quite nicely in cancer and AIDS patients. And now, we're using it in surgical patients, and we believe that's maybe the best one. And then immunonutrition the week before surgery, and the Abbott and the Nestle products that exist are the same, essentially. So whichever flavor you like best or your patient likes best three times a day for the week before surgery. And the volume of these things is approximately? About 250 to 300 cc's is about how big they are. The three-time-a-day Nestle immunonutrition is about 250, 240. It's smaller. You take it three times a day. The Abbott one's a little bigger. You take it twice a day. But either works. That, that alone would, would make big changes. But for him, assuming he's telling you the story that Julie tells you, they tell you, sometimes TPN has to become the answer because they can't literally, there's no way they can eat what they need to eat. And, and so we see. So, so practically, if you started Joshua on supplements, you would want to see him gaining weight, gaining significant weight? Stabilize. Stop losing. Stop losing. Would you yeah. want his album to be greater than three? Is that going to be possible for someone like Joshua? Uh, not in three weeks, probably. Half-life's too long. If his CRP is more than five, if his disease activity is continued, an albumin and a pre will never climb in the face of a CRP more than in U.S. units five. So an inflamed patient makes inflammatory proteins, no matter how many calories and protein you feed them. They do not make anabolic proteins actively. And so the pre and an albumin will not rise in the face of significant inflammation. And so they're not useful tests in that setting to see change. You can feed them all you want without a low CRP. You won't, you won't see anything. So I don't need it to rise, but I need it not to keep dropping. I, I would say, and I know, Julie, if you, you feel Just to make it more generalizable, that's not necessarily true in single-site cancer disease. Hmm. So in metastatic disease, but not in single-site cancer disease. And you can bump those patients yep. in about two and a half to three weeks with oral supplementation. Um, I have to tell them to drink it first. Every time they sit down with their family to a meal, the first thing they do is take their supplement rather than eating. Because it's obvious when they came to me, whatever they were eating, no matter how great a diet they were trying to take, it wasn't enough. So I need them to start with the supplement. And we've had three cases this past month where I've sent an 87, 89, and then the young one was 93. 
out on supplements because they just didn't take enough before, and we were we brought all of the, all of them up. For with sure, an albumin marker, and and two up. of them came up a couple of pounds. So yeah, and you can gain weight. I was thinking more of this active marker, inflamed marker, IBD patient, yeah. but clearly in your diverticulitis, your cancer, your others, they they can gain weight and they should, but I think not losing and compelling them, and it needs to come from the whole care team. The surgeon being the champion, honestly, if anybody might have a surgeon willing to tell them, their compliance skyrockets. All the studies show that. I would have to believe if they're in a pre-op clinic seeing someone that they believe in too, like you heard Linda talk about a PT person can change in a half an hour, patients' outcomes, hearing from a real medical provider or a really effective RD, what a difference it can make will compel them to take it. Just saying, go take this because it might help you isn't going to do it. We're going to set up a system where we have prescriptions for these supplements, and they take them to the outpatient clinic in our hospital, and they get them filled just like a prescription. In the U.S., you can submit that to your health care reimbursement. There's 200 insurers about to cover it, but most don't. Not yet. And then low threshold for enteral, if tolerated, and then yep. parenteral in an IV. Do we have any questions from the floor on the sort of nutrition side of things? Obviously, this is going to be a large part of this discussion with Paul here in this case. So we've got a question at the back. Hi, my name's Fergus Miller. I recognise this case. I don't know how many times I've anaesthetised this scenario in my career. You get the phone call from the surgeon saying, can you go see the young, usually male, on the medical floor, field medical therapy. You go up, the, the physician says, yeah, we've done what we can, it's over to you guys now. And you're listening thinking, really? They're skeletal, you're like, the, the albumin's low, and the surgeon says, yeah, well, we need to go today. And you're like, well, uh, but, uh, and, and it's, it's a done deal, and the patient expects it, and off you roll to the theatre, you think, cross your fingers, you cross your toes, you usually get a bed in my institution in a high dependency unit, so you put them there, you put a central line in so that you can get them TPN afterwards, because you know it's inevitable, despite what the surgeon says. How do you address that? Because I recognise that. I've done that case every year for 30 years. And presumably it's multifaceted. I guess, I mean, having a nutrition lead in your hospital, I think, how many hospitals have a nutrition? Having a nutrition lead and having those conversations with the surgeon ahead of time so you can get pathways in place rather than on that patient on the ward on the day. I don't know. Other thoughts? Yeah, Mike. I just brought, broaden this slightly. I don't think we have as big a problem with Joshua and his disease process because they're all under gastroenterologists who also run the nutrition team and access to TPN. So, so I, that, that's, not my, that's not our problem as, as much. Our problem is a larger group of patients, elderly, having orthopaedic procedures who are malnourished, who we must score everyone, but then we do nothing. And we don't have access to dietitians or nutrition team. It isn't there. And that's where the next lecture I'll give after will really address what do you do with that patient who you, maybe is an emergent laparotomy, right? Maybe it's an emergent orthopedic case. You know, maybe it's not even a patient who's perf now, so then you have, you know, now, you know, Julie's in a spot where she has to operate there's a whole body of literature around that that is growing. That what do you do after? And what nutrition intervention should that patient get after um, to address? Because, again, now you're left with what you're left with. And you're right, many times it's TPN. And, 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 and I would have to say, my experience has been many of the surgeons are very receptive to it. And, and they're not all like Julie in the proactive mindset she has. But, but they are receptive afterwards. And I think we need to convey to them the safety of TPN done correctly and its lack of infectious risk that it now carries and that some people, that's what they need because we know after surgery in ICU and some of this work has been done by Danny and others right here in the UK that the average caloric intake of a post-op or post-ICU patient is about 700 calories a day. They're not going to eat what they need to eat most of the time. And so we're going to need to use other modalities. A question from Saul. Yeah, I, I'm going to go off-road here a little bit. I think this case is too easy because it is an obvious answer. And I think your point, Mike, about 
the real value of having sensitivities to the risk of malnutrition or poor nutrition health would portend to a bad outcome is in the patient who's otherwise stealth to us for risk. And if we don't proactively go look for nutrition health markers, we will never find them. And in some respects, this is almost too easy of a case for us to be speaking about because it's the obvious. It's, I would argue, on the other hand, it's the very much not obvious that is the challenge that we need to overcome. And, and Saul's point is excellent. We, we've been defining some of the questionnaires we'll use in the past clinic that you heard him talk about, and we realize that there's eight or ten questions about have you had a stroke, have you had a heart attack, do you have poor exercise tolerance, all the things we know to ask. But the only way we'd have seen those patients in our nutrition arm would be if they already had a comorbidity of something else. So we realize we have to build these PONS questions, the very simple ones, into this initial screen. Because like I said, there's people who won't have other complications who might be 25 years old but have nutrition risk. And the only way we'll capture them is if we're screening in our phone screens and in our online screens and catching them up front. Because there's a lot of stealth patients like that that we're missing. Desiree, you had a... Well, I was going to say, th- there are. I still would agree, though, that we anesthetize patients every day like this, that the surgeon, it's not necessarily emergent, but, you know, they've had a couple days that they've known that this patient was going to come to surgery. And what's really changed it in our practice is putting in our pathway, our enhanced recovery pathway. And not just because it's the pathway, it's because it's created this conversation that we go up and see the patient, we're like, no, we have to bump this back a little bit. we got to bulk them up. We need to at least give them a little bit of nutrition before they come to us. And then ensuring that that happens postoperatively as well. And so it's the pathway, it's the communication that's really helped us avoid that and have the voice to go back to say to our surgeons what this patient needs. And, and I can't anesthetize this patient today, so that's what's kind of done it. But I think also nutritional screenings in the pre-op clinic has changed, again, as part of our pathway, screening for frailty and other things, and adding those immunonutrition and nutrition pieces in. Any more questions about that before we move on? Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Monty Mythen here from London. <laughs> for those listening overseas. Paul, where do you, and the rest of the panel, where do you stand on the obese malnourished? So they're a challenging patient group. One of my prime collaborators in the U.S. is a trauma surgeon, She's the vice chair of surgery at the University of Maryland, and we did a CT scan study of free-living elderly trauma patients, people driving cars, getting in car wrecks, and we discovered that 75% of them were meaningfully sarcopenic on CT scan because they got the CT for another reason, and we can measure lean body mass by CT. And it didn't predict, looking at them, whether they were sarcopenic. They could be obese, they could be thin, they could be normal weight. The sarcopenia was distributed across that without any discrimination for their actual weight. And so the obese patient can be every bit as sarcopenic as the BMI of 18. It's just they have a lot of other mass around it that doesn't give you the metabolic reserve the muscle gives you. And we found that, although that was true, just the presence of sarcopenia doubled your mortality rate from trauma as a free-living elderly person um, by itself. And so clearly there's immense risk that can occur in the obese patient that maybe is even more stealth even harder to pick up. And I think there's a future for, we believe there's some new, and I'll show you some of it, ultrasound techniques that are better than the ultrasound you heard Linda talk about. Um, These are what athletes and professional sports teams use. And we also believe that CT scanning can tell us a lot about the obese patient and tell us who maybe the sarcopenic nutrition risk patient is, even when they're obese. So so just to pick up on that. So most patients have a CT scan getting major abdominal surgery. Sarcopenia, it's L5, is that correctly? L3. L, the L3 cut on every yep. CT scan yep. should be easy to be able to read for sarcopenia. And, and we're trying to introduce this at Duke because it's a yep. you know, well-validated score of malnutrition. Was there another question back there? Hi there. Raj Neum from Australia. First, I'm a geriatrics trainee, so thank you so much. I'm very passionate about nutrition. Just two comments. Firstly, one comment is about the perioperative stage. I've noticed that a lot of patients have cancellations, and that's where a lot of the nutrition decline happens, and that's quite a sad period, and the cancellations we discussed about earlier. That, in return, impacts their mobility at a later stage. 
And secondly, as a geriatrician and a post-operative period, I actually use families quite a bit. I think it's really important to use families and discuss with families about nutrition and its importance, especially in the stage of when I see family members there together seeing a patient. I tell them to come at a breakfast time, lunch time and dinner time and help feed their family members and encourage that. And I can see a huge significant difference in patient and families as well. So just a comment. It's a great comment. Eating meals is a, is a family communal event. When you can preserve that in the hospital, clearly improves patients' ability to feed themselves. And it's something the patient and the family can do together and be empowered to do. It's one of those few things they can actually take control of. You got a final comment on nutrition? A very final comment on the UK perspective for for obesity. Make friends with what is called your Level 3 weight management service. And Level 3 weight management in the UK will be a physician, psychologist, (coughs) and they will have access to referral to bariatric surgery. And we've got a local pathway where we can directly refer to them if you have a BMI above 40 or if you have a BMI above 35 with uh, symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea or diabetes. And those are the referral guidance for level 3 obesity management in the UK. So there is a service somewhere near you. Great. So I think we'll move on a little bit. We do a very complicated yearly survey on anesthesia practice, which involves a show of hands at Epbon. And we've already done it with crystalloid and colloid, and we've seen quite a swing to crystalloid, which was very interesting yesterday. So say Joshua is optimised, he gets his BMI up to 20, he's ready for surgery, it's obviously going to be an open surgery because he's had previous surgery. How many people here in the anesthesia world would put an epidural in for analgesia for Joshua? Quite a few. How many people would do a spinal with some sort of intrathecal opioid? Some. As I know, Southampton practice. How many people would do some abdominal wall catheters? Quite a number. How many people would do um, some, an IV lidocaine infusion? Quite a number as well. How many people would use some intravenous ketamine as part of an analgesia plan? Yeah. Equally, quite a number. Mm-hmm. Uh, how many people would do regular acetaminophen, paracetamol? And regular non steroidals? <laughs> not many. There's an absolutely there, and that's a lot less hands than I thought. Julie, I know you, inflammatory bowel disease, we use non steroidals for most of our patients. Inflammatory bowel disease. Who were listening, oh, uh, you didn't give the result for the paracetamol. The, that was the majority. Paracetamol was almost everyone. But, but the non steroidal was shockingly few, wasn't it? Non steroidal was about 5%, I would say. So I think that's worth delving into. We do non steroidals for. Most of our patients that do, apart from our inflammatory bowel disease patients. So, Julie, what, the anastomotic leak story? No, no, it, there's anecdotal evidence that patients have counterintuitive inflammatory response to non steroidal anti inflammatories in IBD, periop and not periop. And because of that, one, you'll probably see a lot of your IBD patients come to you with an allergy. They'll have an allergy to ibuprofen. But that's their gastroenterologist trying to tell you not to give it to them. And most gastroenterologists recommend not giving non anti-inflammatories in IBD. But we do use them for our cancer patients, our bowel anastomoses. We have switched to a selective rather than the broad, but we don't have an IV version of selective, so we will still use it sometimes perioperatively. And our ACER and POKI guidelines that were published recommended using non steroidals routinely in major abdominal surgery and didn't recommend that the literature surrounding an osteomotic leak is strong enough to not use non steroidals with the benefit they have on analgesia. I see some. Do you have got a comment? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm with gastroenterologists an awful lot. The problem with ibuprofen is if, if they're not eating, they're going to get tummy upset. You say you don't use ibuprofen. I mean, there's lots of other things you can use, Celebrex, uh, uh, Mobic, any of those things. So that allergy story or the story that they get, they can't take it because they chug up. You've combined my two responses. We 
most typically for all of our patients uh, having elective surgery, use a COX-2 selective. We don't use any in our IBD patients. Ironically, we're told as IBD patients not to take Tylenol because we'll end up with liver injury and PSC. I was told that at the Mayo Clinic when I had surgery there. Uh, it, it's exceedingly rare, right? And it's probably unrelated, but we're warned. You don't get PSC. Right, of course you don't, right. We, 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 if we, you have it. Right, right, right. But I, you'll have patients tell you that. I've had patients tell me that, and I was told that. All right. Any other comments on analgesia? We're going to move on to fluid management. Um, how many people would do goal-directed hemodynamic therapy for Joshua? I'd say that's around 30 to 40 percent, which is interesting. How many people would like to do goal-directed fluid therapy but don't have the equipment or the resources available at their hospital? That's only one or two. And how many people think goal-directed fluid therapy is not indicated as the evidence base isn't there? And that's about five or ten patients. Tim, where does this patient fall on your graduated use of selective use of goal-directed therapy? Do you want to comment, Monty? I, I, I mean, I'd classify this patient as high risk on that matrix. I would as well. I mean, high risk of bleeding, abdominal surgery, although he's, you know... Young. One comment on those of you that wouldn't use an epidural, I can tell you what the last surgery I had three years ago. I had three epidurals that went for 20 days, and it was the best surgical experience I ever had pain-wise. I was walking on a stair stepper seven days out. I couldn't eat, but I could stair step, and I couldn't have done it without the epidural. It was enormously helpful. And we would routinely use an epidural in this yeah. patient. And in fact, we had an article in the Wall Street Journal about enhanced recovery to try and get things out there for the patient perspective. Julie had her picture in the Wall Street Journal. I didn't. Um, <laughs> and it was a patient. It had inflammatory bowel disease and had a terrible experience at other hospitals, um, which is always good to report on. You know, <laughs> worst pain ever, pitting edema of their legs because they had so much fluid, couldn't walk, nasogastric tube for five days, miserable experience, came to our hospital, had an epidural, gold directed fluid therapy, uh, ate and drink immediately post-operatively, went home on post-op day four or five. And um, I can actually say this here, it was like chalk and cheese. No one understands what that is in the States. They will look at me as if I'm uh, um, completely mad. But it was like chalk and cheese, the whole experience compared to the previous. And I think that's, that's pretty powerful. It's very true. For us, Joshua would be referred to the acute pain team who would find out what's worked for him or not worked for him in the, the past. And a plan would be made by Joshua and the acute pain team. And the anaesthetists would do what they're told. <laughs> But it's, I think it's very important. You, you, you can't run an epidural service without an acute, an acute pain team. Right, that's true. T- Tim, can I, can I uh, co-chair, chip in for a second, because we're close on time. Mike, I just want to pick you up on two things. You can guess one of them. Um, the first one was you throw right at the beginning that we need to revive enhanced recovery. What, what, what have we learned from having what appeared to be a fantastic award-winning enhanced recovery program post a child around the world to stopping those endeavours and things falling apart again? Two things. Feeding back the results that you have deteriorated and then the other is driving the process post-operatively by having clinicians continually checking the system is working properly. So data and compliance are a rule. You've got, you've got to know compliance levels, you've got to know yeah. outcomes. Well, just, so related, just picking up on that, yep. clinicians or enhanced recovery coordinators? Because in my experience it's the coordinator can do that and the clinicians are often too busy. I don't care who it is as long as they do it. And the dynamics may be different in different hospitals as to who's the best person to do that. The second one just related to the, and it's alluded to up there, about the observations about the use of fluids, for example. When you get a chance, I know there's going to be a whole load of adjusters in there, you know, number of beds, you know, UCLH is seven hospitals, for example, number of IT beds, all that sort of thing's got to go in. But the other thing is, just a, an observation in passing is when we had Dr. Foster and we did have national rankings, UCLH was the hospital that gave you the greatest chance of survival in England. So maybe everyone else is not using enough of those things. Yeah. <laughs> the, the data that we're going to use Just will ask second. questions, yeah. not give answers. No. So it, it will be, should you be looking at your use of? 
We've got a question here I think is worth exploring. How useful is albumin as a marker of nutrition in those with chronic inflammatory states such as IBD, malignancy, and autoimmune disease? So we know it's got a lot of limitations. Paul, would you like to comment on that? It being low is concerning because the NISQIP data, just Julie would even know better than I would, reflects what's in the chart before they have surgery or the time of surgery. And clearly having a low albumin, whether it be from inflammation or a combination of inflammation or malnutrition or malnutrition alone, has this predictive outcome of poor outcomes. And I think those are the patients we're most likely to make a difference in. I don't think we can say with any certainty that there's a way that if you increase it or don't increase it, that is the magic marker. But I think that just the sheer presence of low albumin, no matter the cause, creates a patient significant risk. And that's a patient who should have these kinds of preoperative interventions addressed most aggressively, and nutrition being an important one of them. So we but know, no, it's not a perfect nutrition marker. We know our has away. limitations, but it's an easy-to-measure marker of, of, risk of risk that contributes to having some understanding of a nutritional status of the patient. Yeah, so I have a question. We use albumin and we use CT for markers of nutrition. What about the overweight, so BMI above 40, pregnant women that are more likely to have a cesarean section? Should they routinely have um, supplementary drinks? Huh. That, that, that's a great question. You know, this, yeah, an ultrasound would be helpful there if you really wanted to think about the risk they were at, I suppose, at this point and trying to evaluate lean body mass perhaps in the future that way because they're not likely to have a CT scan and, and, of course, they're not likely to have a meaningful albumin. Is the implication they can't take appropriate protein and nutrition yeah, orally? Yeah, it's a great question. Is it? Well, I mean, they've managed to get themselves to a BMI of 40, so... Right. <laughs> but, just, I mean, uh, diet advice rather than yeah. a supplement? I'm just... Actually, I can think of a patient we saw at Duke that a... was, was a bit like this, who, who came in and she screened into our clinic because she had a very low album, but she was obese. Yeah. And she was coming for a large operation. And we actually had eight weeks with her because she also had renal failure and some issues around her dialysis ended up having her, it was a big vascular surgery, her case being canceled. And so, yes, she knew how to eat plenty, but we, we didn't feel like she was eating the right things, and that's why our being was low and her other comorbidities. And we put her on these high-protein neural nutrition supplements, and she actually lost a little weight. And she seemed to say she felt better than she ever had before. Because essentially we changed her diet to, from a high-carbohydrate fat diet to a high-protein diet. And so she lost weight, likely gained muscle mass, felt better, and had a wonderful operation without a complication. It's an N of one, but it's, it gets to your question. Right? I'm almost out, but can I ask everyone on the panel, and yourself as well, Tim, although you overlap, where Joshua would have gone to post-operatively in light of the, some of the information we heard earlier on today about high care availability. But when you say the place that Joshua would have gone to, can you qualify what that looks like as well? Because some people tell me their patient's gone to step-down, and I go and visit step-down, and it looks to me like HDU if you see what I mean, even though the implication is it's the floor with 14 to 1 nursing and good luck, if you see what I mean. So where would Joshua go to? Julie, do you want to comment from our perspective? Sure. I would expect uh, Joshua's fluid to be managed in such a way, and he didn't come in with a pulmonary problem, that he would be extubated in the operating room, taken to what I refer to as the recovery room or the PACU, where they are on telemetry with pulse ox, but that's when we stop our... IV drip and manage the most immediate post-operative issues for about one to two hours. Then he would go out to the ward floor, and likely because of all the hands I saw about ketamine and IV lidocaine, there would be some institutional requirements on his being either on a central telemetry and or pulse ox. He wouldn't be in a room where the monitor inside the room really made any difference. It goes centrally just to let us know about issues. So just to give you, you a U.S. perspective where we work at Duke, we have the ICU, where you obviously can get everything, and then we, we can either go to the ward or what we call step-down. Step-down is an increased nursing ratio, but you still cannot have a phenylephrine or any vasopressor infusion. You cannot have an arterial line. So we want a 1.5. We haven't got a 1.5. If we want to keep an arterial line in 
or run any kind of background vasopressor, they would have to go to the intensive care unit. We do have a lot of intensive care beds at Duke, I'll give you that. Um, there's nearly 100. So the SICU would be the place that he went if he needed to go there. But again, we have the same problems. If you go to the SICU, they're more likely to not be mobilised, to be treated like an intensive care patient. And Julie, like most surgeons, would rather her patients don't go to the SICU for that reason. And I think that's very similar. So what Joshua would go to the floor or to a step-down bed if he needed a bit more nursing with an epidural running. His IV would come down in PACU, so he'd be drinking, eating and mobilising as early as we can, either on post-op day zero or post-op day one. I started my answer with extubation in the OR because that's almost required for us to get an ICU bed. The patient has to be intubated. That's what we tend to have all of our units full with intubated patients. So he, I don't know that we'd have the option. We might be able to stay in the PACU if they were. Which is not popular. Yeah. Mike? <laughs> for us, he would be extubated. He would go to recovery. He would then go to the intensive care unit for level two care primarily because inflammatory bowel patients, even, but even young ones, age doesn't make any difference, are unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. Desiree? I would say similar. It just depends on where the patient is in PACU and if they're, you know, if they're kind of hanging all right, we'll send them up to the ward. But they're an ERAS patient nonetheless. And so if they go to the ICU, it took a lot of work. But we talked to them about trying to implement enhanced recovery, getting them up, you know, as much as possible and pain control and things like that was an uphill battle, but we've done that in our ICU. So they can be extubated and be there for, usually it's a day, and then they head up to the ward as long as there's no problems. You didn't specifically ask who was going to care for the patient. uh, I would. Personally, personally, I don't care providing they care, if you see what I mean. So if they've just got their name over the bed and that doesn't have an impact, then let's get someone who cares. Yeah, just to spin on the enhanced recovery going to the critical care unit is we've found that our anesthesiologists who run half of the critical care unit at any one time, our surgical ICU is split as far as management, are very resistant to enhanced recovery in the unit. It's been one of our greatest challenges in the entire hospital. So when you mention it's hard, it is really hard. Sorry, Denny. Great, we're a couple minutes over. Is there a final... Question from Danny. More a comment rather than a question. Enhanced recovery or its equivalent in critical care, as Linda was referring to earlier, is becoming more widespread. And certainly we found that the surgical patients are now being moved more because we have an early mobilization program for all ventilated patients. And perhaps that's a way to get to the mindset of more closed intensive care units. So our ventilated patients are now on cycles whilst on the ventilator and I think that you know is a way to change the thought processes. In closing Tim I just noticed there's a great question that's gone to the top of the list there we're not going to address it now but to remind people that next week we're going to try and get all the questions that have been archived on Slido answered by calling various different presenters from the Top Med Talk studio so we'll hopefully keep you informed and hopefully get every question answered that people have voted for. Thank you. Great so I'd like to thank the panellists thank you all for your engagement. And don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team. All you need to do is turn up at one of our events. Check out ebpom.org for more details. ebpom.org. Our next big event is between the 28th and the 30th of September in Chicago. That's EBPOM USA, the Chicago Masters course, perioperative care practicum. Between the 28th and the 30th of September. ebpom.org for more details. That's ebpom.org.